This video is the first on categorical tests, and it's going to cover two different tests for goodness of fit. So remember from the last video that you test for goodness of fit when you want to know if the observed counts from a single sample agree with your prior expectation. So this video will introduce the exact binomial test and the exact multinomial test. So let's imagine a scenario where you identify 200 craters on the moon and find that 90 are in the northern hemisphere and 110 are in the southern hemisphere. So you might ask if the crater distribution is random or if that is that 110 in the southern hemisphere is sort of an, an unusual concentration. So to test for goodness of fit, we need an expectation. We need to compare our observations to an expected frequency. Um, so at the, at the simplest, the area of each hemisphere is, is equal, and they're each half of the moon, so we might expect that 50% of the craters should occur in each hemisphere. So you could have other more sophisticated expectations that take into account the age of the surface in different parts of the moon or whatever. But for our purposes, we'll just use this very simple one of 50% in each hemisphere. So to test this, the, the test that we can use to answer this question is called the exact binomial test. So you use it on categorical data in the case where you have only two categories in a single sample. So in the example I just laid out, the two categories are the two hemispheres, either northern or southern, and the single sample is, is the moon. Our data is one sample. We counted 200 craters. That's our sample. And so we're testing if the categories have the expected count with the null hypothesis that the sample's abundance count comes from a population with a frequency that equals the expected value, in our case, 50% or, or 0.5. So frequency in this sense means the number of times that an event occurs in a series of independent observations. So if you look at one crater and the next crater and the next crater, what is the frequency? How often do we find ones in the southern hemisphere? So this test is an exact test, so there's no distribution, there's no statistic, there's no degrees of freedom. We just calculate the p-value exactly from the probability of observing the data. So as in all tests, the p-value is the probability of obtaining a result at least as extreme as observed if the null hypothesis is true. So essentially what we want to know is what is the chance of observing at least 110 craters in one hemisphere if the true frequency is actually 50%, which is our expectation from the null hypothesis. So to answer that, we need to learn a little bit about binomial probability. So if the craters are equally divided between the hemispheres and you choose one crater at random, this is often called a trial, so our trial will, will do one, we'll choose one crater, um, there are two possible outcomes. The crater is either not in the southern hemisphere which we can call a failure of our trial, or it is in the southern hemisphere, which we can call a success of our trial. The probability of a success on the right is 0.5, or a 50% chance, and the probability of failure is just 1 minus the probability of success, because the two outcomes are contingent, you have one or the other, so this is 1 minus 0.5. Of course, it's also 0.5 here, but remember that the expectation doesn't have to be 50%. So after sampling a second crater, there end up being four outcomes. Uh, if the first trial was a failure, the second trial, um, the failure meaning the crater is not in the southern hemisphere, the second trial could be either another failure or it could be a success, finding a crater in the southern hemisphere. And then if the first trial was a success, the second could be either a failure or another success. And so the probability of two successive events is just the probability of each one multiplied, assuming that those events are independent of one another. So basically, the probability of two successive failures is just 1 minus 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5. That equals 0 0.25. And so you can see that the probability of each of the four outcomes is 0 0.25, or 25%. So one more step before we can generalize this to the binomial probability. So let's say we add a third crater. Now there's eight possibilities. We could have three failures in a row here. No southern so we end up with no southern hemisphere craters. So the probability of that is 1 minus 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5, or 0 0.125, 1 out of 8. There actually are three ways to get one crater in the southern hemisphere at the end. It could happen in the first trial, or the second trial, or the third trial. And so the probability of each of those outcomes is also 1 out of 8. We have 
1 minus 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. We have two, prob two failures, one success. So we multiply those three probabilities together. There are also um, three different ways that we can end up with two southern hemisphere craters, and the same probabilities apply. In this case, it's 1 minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. And there's only um, one way to get three craters in the southern hemisphere. Um, that has the probability, so we have to have three successes in a row. That has a probability of 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.1.5, which is the same as 0.5 cubed. So to generalize, if we have n trials and k of them are successes, this is sort of the standard um, lettering used for this, each trial has a probability of success of p. So in our case, p is 0.5, because we have a probability of success of 0.5. n is the number of trials, or 3. And k is the number of successes, so either 0, 1, 2, or 3. OK, so basically, um, the overall probability of finding any given outcome is the probability of finding k successes multiplied by the probability of finding n minus k failures multiplied by the number of different ways you can get that many successes. I'll just note that this little n over k symbol is not division. It's actually a symbol that means the number of ways that you can choose k items from n. So if you want to follow through on your own, you can see how this general formula for binomial probability comes from and works for each of the four columns at the top. Okay, so that formula allows us to generate a discrete probability distribution called the binomial distribution, which is shown here. It kind of has a bell shape like the normal distribution that you've seen before, but note that it's a discrete distribution. It can only have whole number values. We can calculate the probability of finding 110 or 109, but there is no such thing as a probability of finding 109.5. So the binomial distribution gives the probability of each outcome if our null hypothesis is true. So in our case of 200 craters, the null hypothesis gives the most likely um, the ex sorry, and with an expected probability of 0 0.5, the most likely outcome is finding 100 craters. Um, however, because we have a small sample drawn randomly from a larger population, there could be some range in the outcomes, and that's what the binomial distribution tells us. It tells us the range of outcomes and each of their probabilities that we might expect if the null hypothesis was true. So we can calculate a p an exact p-value from this binomial distribution. So the distribution gives us the probability of finding all possible outcomes if the null hypothesis is true. So we just add up the ones where that are at least as extreme as our observation. Right, so we find the probability of finding 110 and 111, 112, 113, etc., 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 and add those all up. Note that is, as in many of the previous tests, we have to look at both tails. We don't just look at 110 and greater, we also look at 90 and 89 and 88 and 87, and so forth. Um, and that is because we didn't know beforehand whether there be more craters in the southern hemisphere. We're really just testing the probability of finding at least 110 craters in one of the hemispheres, and it just so happens we're looking at the southern hemisphere. Okay, so the, that's the exact binomial test. It works for only two categories. So what if you have more? For example, let's say you know the area that three different rock types cover on the surface of the moon. And you have counts of 86 different meteorites that came from the moon. We might wonder if the meteorites accurately reflect the moon's geology, right? If 75% is a north of site, you might expect 75% of the meteorites to be a north of site. Um, so we could do, you know, multiple exact binomial tests, but remember the problem that you run into with multiple comparisons, the problem of enhanced type 1 error risk. So the exact multinomial test is designed for when you have more than two categories. It has much the same approach as the binomial test. It's for categorical data, so for categorical data only, but in the case when you have three or more categories in your single sample. Its purpose is to test if the category counts match the expectation 
uh, with the null hypothesis, they're drawn from a population with a set of frequencies that equal our expected values. So I'm actually not going to go into detail how it works, uh, because it's very difficult to graphically illustrate the multinomial distribution, but it's very analogous to the binomial test. It calculates an exact p-value by looking at all events, at least as extreme as what you found, but using a discrete probability distribution called the multinomial distribution in this case. So for either of these tests, when you're reporting the results, you should give your observed counts or a frequency percentage. Um, you should give the test name, whether you did the exact binomial or multinomial test, and you should give the, the p-value. Um, there is an exact test, um, so there isn't a test statistic, there's no degrees of freedom to worry about, but you might want to explain why you chose a particular expectation. So I didn't do it at the bottom here, but I did sort of write out how you could include these things, the, the observed counts, the test name, and the p-value in, in your summary. So the function binome.test in R for the bi exact binomial test requires three inputs. It requires the number of successes in one of the categories. This will be just one number. It requires the number of trials. This is the total number of items in both categories together, also just one number and it requires the expected probability of success. And this will also be just one number between 0 and 1. So the output summarizes the data, um, and it gives the p-value. It also lists the alternative hypothesis and the observed probability of the, tr the sample probability of success, and it gives the 95% confidence interval on that uh, probability of success. But really, for our purpose, we just need to focus on the, on the p-value, basically. So the exact multinomial test function isn't available in the basic version of R. You'll need to install the package called EMT. This function requires two inputs, a numeric vector first that contains the observed counts in each category. There might be three, four, you know, many counts, however many you have, you put them in a vector, and then you need a corresponding numeric vector that has the expected probabilities, P1, P2, in, in each category. So remember that you use this C function to combine numbers into a vector, or to combine individual elements into a vector. So the probabilities will be numbers between 0 and 1, and they must add up to 1. In the output, the key piece of information again is, is the p-value. The results also list the total number of possible outcomes and the probability of observing the exact result that you got, but you don't need to include those when you report your results. But really, make sure that you're reporting the p-value of the test, not the p-value of the exact outcome, because we want to know, because the p-value is defined as the probability of observing an outcome at least as extreme, not just the outcome of the one case that you had.